Okay, so it should be our final class today. And for today, we would like to finish about our program verification lecture, which we started on Monday. And today I might go, uh, I'll try to still uh, slow down, you know, when I talk about the critical things. But there will, there will be quite many details that you have to follow the slides in order to do the proof. I'll try to give you enough hints in the class so you will know how to continue uh, to really study the topics. Okay, let me just uh, go over very quickly what we said about last time. So just as a reminder, so whenever you think about program verification, you really have to keep this in mind, the big picture. Okay, so if you think about program verification, basically you're given certain program and most specifically you have implementation and also you have specification. So now if you got some feature F and then you got require and also you got ensure. So these two parts are the uh, contracts and also you have the do and body. So that'll be the implementation, right? So this, uh, I can think about this part here is the implementation. And these two parts are the specification. And somehow you can turn these guys into some so-called whore triple, okay? The whore triple looks something like this, okay? So this is a whore triple. Let me be a little bit more precise. In the general form, your precondition will be Q, let's say, and also your post condition will be, let's say, R. Just some Boolean expression, it can be compound. And also you have your implementation, and which can be as complicated as maybe uh, simple loops or even nested loop. We don't really talk about nested loop for the lecture, but at least we'll show you how you can do verification for simple loops. We'll get there towards the end of today. So we got precondition, we got postcondition, also we got implementation. What you will do is you'll try to formulate it into the so-called whore triple. So now you can see that over here, I already got a whore triple here for you. So you can see precondition is turned into uh, the first place in the whole triple. And also you can see for the uh, implementation, it's actually put in the middle over here. It simply means starting in a, in a state that satisfy the precondition, which means the uh, inputs are valid. If you try to, uh, try to execute the implementation, you're going to number one, terminates, and number two, up upon termination, you're going to satisfy the uh, post condition R, which is over here. Okay, that's what whole triple really means. And we talk about visually what really means for the whole triple to be true, okay? So now, again, let me emphasize this. So whenever we talk about whole triple, right? You got precondition here, implementation, and postcondition. The whole thing for the uh, whole triple is actually a Boolean expression, okay? Think about it as a Boolean expression, or think about it as like predicates. Uh, predicates, okay? What you learn from 1090. And so given a predicate, you can prove that to be a tautology, can prove that to be a theorem, or you can disprove it by giving counter example. Let me just talk about very, uh, uh, just review very quickly what we said from Monday. Given some post condition over here, let's say this is your post condition for your program, okay? So this is your post condition. And now we, uh, when you try to do verification, you try to go backwards. So now you got an implementation in the middle. So that'll be what you execute at the runtime. So given implementation S and also given the post condition R, you can calculate the so-called weakest precondition over here. So this is so-called weakest precondition. We already talked about how you can calculate for assignments from Monday. So now we today we'll talk about more rules. We'll get there. And once you calculate the WP, so WP simply means any, uh, any value that satisfy the pre uh, weakest precondition. Let me write it down here. Any input value satisfying the WP by executing S Right? Any state, for example, some value over here that actually satisfy the WP, right? And now if you satisfy the WP and then you try to execute the implementation, it's guaranteed you end up in a state that's in the post condition, right? We talk about predicates being satisfying set. By executing S, we will terminate in a state satisfying post condition R. 
Okay, so here are the critical things you want to keep in mind. Okay, so you got implementation, you got also post condition, and also you got the pre weakest precondition, right? So these are the key terms. And now, in order to prove that your original program is actually correct, what you have to pay attention to is the precondition, the Q over here. In this particular case, Q is no weaker than the weakest precondition. So that means every input value that satisfies Q is also going to satisfy WP because it's a subset, right? Let me just say that quickly. So now in this particular case, let me use uh, orange over here, okay? So now each input satisfying the precondition Q, right? That's the program's precondition Q also satisfies the WP over here, right? So now you can see we also talk about two key terms, you know, Q and also WP. So this is the case where it is correct. Okay, let me just mention once more. So this is really telling you, so this is a very important correctness condition. So this tells you the program is actually correct. If it is not the case, then it will not be correct. For example, what will not be correct? Let me draw that very quickly. If you uh, recall what we, uh, I also got another drawing in the next slides. If you simply got, let's say, for example, hypothetically, if this is your precondition Q, let's say over here, hypothetically, okay? If a uh, scenario number two, if this is your precondition Q, let's say Q prime, okay? So now this is, uh, let me try to make it a little bit uh, better. So now if you try to do this, okay, we talk about another Q prime. Q prime is just another hypothetical precondition, right? So now in this case, it's gonna tell us over here, uh, let me just use maybe, uh, uh, maybe purple, okay? So now for this particular Q prime, okay, some value satisfying Q prime cannot satisfy WP. For example, you can see this value over here, right? If you see this particular purple value I just write over here, you can see this value here satisfies Q prime, but it does, it does not reside inside WP. So it does not satisfy. There's, there's at least one case, like a counter example, okay? So now this tells me that the program is not correct, okay? You can think about this condition tells you that the program is incorrect. Okay, versus correct. Okay, it's, it's a very quick summary, correct versus incorrect, okay? Uh, it's a very quick summary of what we said on Monday, okay? And then if you look at another example over here, I'm not gonna repeat. So this is one of the example we talk about, right? So the WP over here should be uh, I larger than, uh, I larger than four. But somehow the Q you have over here is I larger than three, which is weaker than the weakest precondition. So this tells you that this program is incorrect. So this example is not new. We talked about it already on Monday, okay? Okay, guys, any questions? So far, it's just review, all right? So now what we want to do is we talk about the weakest precondition, just the first rule, which is assignments. And the way to think about it is, let me just tell you the, the, this one very quickly, okay? So now let's think about this. Let's say if we want to satisfy the post condition R, right? So we think about backwards. And then we have basically another, this is the implementation, okay? So this is the implementation. And this is the post condition. And then let's say implementation is simply just a simple variable assignments. Let's say X is assigned to E, okay? So now what we want to really tell you in this rule is, what should be the WP for uh, X is assigned to E, which is this implementation here, to establish R, okay? So what is that, right? Basically that's how we, uh, the last part that we talk about on Monday. So now let's see what that should be, right? Basically, think about every, in the pre-states, every occurrence of X is actually going to be replaced by E. 
So now the week is precondition. You can uh, refer to the recording on Monday. We explain in detail the intuition. So now the week is precondition now should be, you simply think about, it's simply just R like this. But we know that somehow the post state value of X over here is going to be replaced by E. So in order for that post condition to be satisfied later, it's better that expression E already satisfy R in the pre-state. So that'll be every free occurrence of X is replaced by E, okay? It's a very quick review. And you may actually want to think a little bit more about intuitively why this should be the rule for the assignments for WP, okay? Uh, quick review. Okay, so there's another example on the slides. Let me just go there and then we'll solve that very quickly together. And then we can move on to the next rule for alternation. Okay, that's the rule. And then uh, we talk about this particular example on Monday. Okay, we did it already, so I'm gonna uh, go on. Okay, this is just another example over here. Okay, so now, uh, oh, sorry, there's another uh, here. There's a typo over here. The post condition should be x equals 23. Okay, I'm gonna fix that, okay? Let's look at this whole triple over here. Let's say x is assigned to x plus one. And then the post condition we want to set, uh, satisfy will be 23. So I'm gonna solve this uh, mechanically just to give you, uh, just uh, let you warm up with the process of pro uh, proving things. And, uh, but what's really important is you want to see why we have to do such substitution, okay? Let me switch to iPad over here. So now we only want to calculate the WP. Again, this is a typo here. It's not really this, it should be this. X equals 23, okay? So now, how do we calculate the weakest precondition, right? Weakest precondition. So now what we want to do is WP. Okay, so now, first of all, you want to put the implementation, which is X is assigned to X plus one. X is assigned to X plus one. Separated by, okay, the next argument will be the uh, post condition. Uh, in that case, let me use green, the post condition over here. So that'll be X is assigned to 23. Okay, it's a very simple calculation over here. And in order to calculate that, you simply have to apply the rule. Okay, so now for you to actually uh, outline your proof or calculation, I would, I would suggest equational style, which I introduced you to on Monday. So you would say that's equal to, by definition, the definition of WP for assignments, I can just say call it equal, right? That's for the assignments. So now all I got to do is I'm going to now say X equals 23, right? That's a post condition. And then I'm going to now do the substitution, the same predicate over here. And then every occurrence of X is now going to be replaced by, okay. Think about the call it equal here means substitution. We want to substitute the every occurrence of X by whatever value you're trying to uh, assign that into. In this case, it would just be X plus one, right? So now I would say X plus one. So now how do we simplify this particular case? Well, so now it would just be simplification. So now in order to simplify that, you can see now X should be replaced by X plus one. That should be equal to 23. Okay, simplify a little bit further. That's equivalent to x equals 22. So this is the final answer. Remember, initially, we want to calculate this particular WP. That's our goal. And then we end up having this particular Boolean predicates. So that tells us in order to establish x equals 23 as the post condition. And also given that the implementation to achieve it will be x is assigned to x plus one. What would be the weakest precondition? What would be the maximum set of input values that will allow such implementation to establish the post condition over here? And it turns out this is the weakest precondition. So that's what we are calculating, right? So now any precondition that you actually put for your, for this particular implement, uh, for this particular routine, anything that's uh, no weaker than x equals 22. But now this is a special case. Because if you think about it, uh, x equals 22. What's the corresponding set? It's basically just a set over here. It's a singleton set. There's only one single element there, which will be 
x is simply just 22. That's the only value that's allowed, which means any precondition, for example, if your actual q uh, for your precondition, right, we use the q. If the actual precondition for your uh, precondition q, for example, q is actually like a superset of the weakest precondition. In that case, uh, the program would not a program would not be correct. Because it might contain certain value, for example, this value could be x equals 21. If x is equal to 21, in that case, starting with a state where x is equal to 21, if you try to say x is assigned to x plus 1, uh, you will actually get uh, x equals 22, which does not satisfy the post condition. Right? So guys, it's a very simple example here. I just want to show you, given implementation over here, and also given the post condition, how can you calculate the weakest precondition? So here, so far, we're just dealing with assignments. We haven't got to anything complicated yet, but we will. Okay, any questions? Any uh, confusion? Any part you would like me to review? Okay, everybody's okay? All right. Okay, so now, what we want to do now is to explain the WP rule. So just remember for the WP calculation, assignment is simply just a basic one. So we have to learn about other things. We got to learn about alternation. And also we got to learn about sequential composition because when you execute your code, uh, procedure code, it's going to execute line by line. So it should be a sequential flow. So we got to learn about these and then we get to loops. Okay, so now let's say this particular uh, rule is if we say if certain condition B, the branching condition, if B is true, we execute S1. So S1 over here, so we are defining WP recursively. So every, pro excuse me, every programming statements we have can be arbitrarily complicated. So I just say S1. If B is true, we execute S1. If B is not true, we execute S2, okay? So now to really get some intuition, Okay, so now let's think about this, right? Um, so now we are trying to figure out what should this be, right, uh, for WP rule. What we can think about is, let's say this. We say if, then, else, and, right? So now let's think about, let's say if B is true, we're actually going to do uh, S1. Otherwise, if B is not true, we're going to do S2. Okay, that's a programming statement. So now what you're going to think about is, how can I actually calculate the WP? And notice that at the end, we want to satisfy this particular post condition, right? So you can think about at the end, upon the termination, either if you go to either, flow, either branch, if you go to the if branch, or you go to the else branch, either way, you're going to establish the R no matter what. So now let me put R over here. So R would simply just be the post condition. And I can put a curly brackets over here, which means upon the termination, you're going to establish R. So now, uh, I will get to the critical part and then I will let you tell me how you think, okay? It is a critical part. We have to make a design decision for this rule. If you th simply think about, if I try to execute this particular fragment of code at a runtime, how many possible execution flows can I have? Apparently just two, okay? Let me just try to write it down. Okay, execution flow number one. Okay, let me use blue. If B is simply just true, and then I'm gonna establish S1, in which case I want to make sure R is actually satisfied. Okay, and then I got another one over here. Let's say I try to execute, I try to check this particular branch, but B is actually not satisfied, which means I'm gonna bypass S1. So that means I'll go to the else and then I'll uh, execute S2. In that case, I should also expect to establish the R over here, right? You can see if I talk about either the blue or the pink execution flow, these are the only two flows available to me. If I want to think about the rule, before I get to combining them into a single predicate, let me let me uh, give you a little bit hints, okay? Let me write it down here. For the blue part, okay, when B is actually true, so that means I'm going to execute S1, and then I'm expecting to establish R over here, right? So that means I can definitely calculate what is the WP for S1. 
to establish R. And even more, I know that I will only execute S1 under the assumption that B has been satisfied already. Otherwise, I'll simply bypass the branch, right? That's kind of the meaning we know from the programming language. And in order to really express about assumption and consequence, right? We got antecedents, we got consequence. We know directly that we should use the uh, imprecation, right? So that'll be B implies WP over here, right? First of all, let's take a look at that. Guys, any question about what I have seen, what we have seen so far, okay? Basically what I have said was, under the assumption that B is already satisfied, we know that we're going to go into the if branch and then execute S1. After S1 upon termination, we want to establish the post condition over here. So that's talking about the first execution flow. And let's do something very similar. If I want to talk about the second flow, right? The pink one. I will know that when I actually get to this part, B is simply not satisfied. In that case, I will know that I will go to the else branch. In that case, I'm going to execute S2. And when S2 is executed, I want to make sure upon termination, R is actually going to be established. So what can I write? I can say it's going to be WP for S2 to establish R. But now I'm executing S2 under a different assumption. If you think about, I will only get to the else, right? And the runtime is going to be sequential. So if this branch doesn't really satisfy, I will go to the next one. So now, so that means it's going to be not B implies WP. Guys, so far so good? Okay, hopefully you are following me. So now the only question I have for you is like this. You can see the goal for this uh, presentation over here is, and we want to calculate what's the WP over here for this entire uh, programming statements, for this entire thing, okay? So now the question mark, question mark over here should be a single predicate. But now how many predicates do we have? We have one predicate for the if branch. We have another predicate for the else branch. Okay, I'll write it down very quickly for you. You can think about this is for the if part. And this is the part for the else part. Okay, there are two separate predicates. However, for as far as the result for the WP for this particular if statement is concerned, we just need a single predicate. So now, which one should we choose? Should we choose the if part or should we choose the else part? We cannot choose both because yeah, exactly. So we cannot choose both. First of all, we cannot choose both because there will be two predicates. But if we choose both, oh, sorry, we cannot choose both because we're only expecting one single predicate. But if you want to combine them, right, definitely you cannot choose either this one or this one alone because it wouldn't be complete. So now many of you actually were suggesting about uh, how we can combine them. Okay, I see two answers already. So that's why it will be quite worth uh, talking about it quickly. Okay. So now here, uh, to really, uh, there are two options over here. Either we can combine them using conjunction, okay? To say the WP for the entire if statement should be the conjunction of the if part and the else part, okay? That's one, one uh, scenario, okay? Another possibility would be disjunction, okay? One or two, okay? Of course, we cannot choose both cases, either one or two. Okay, so now the question is, should we use a uh, conjunction or should we use disjunction? I have seen the answer from you guys for both. So I think uh, there might be some confusion as to uh, intuitively what should be the case, right? Okay, guys, uh, I'm gonna talk about, okay, I see two over here, that's good. So at least uh, several of you are thinking about number two. Okay, you're thinking about to say either, I can tell you that I can see your intuition. You're basically saying either I go for this branch or I go for this branch. I don't know which one. At the runtime, uh, I want to make sure uh, the post condition R is satisfied. I don't know which branch I'm going to choose. However, I'm going to illustrate to you. It turns out the answer should be one. It should be one. Because if I put it just slightly differently, if you actually say one, which means in order to calculate the WP for this particular if statements, I want to make sure the WP here is basically going to be, going to make sure 
if I go for the if branch, I'm going to satisfy the R. And also, if I go for the else branch, I'm also going to satisfy R. So it should be a conjunction. Okay, but that's okay. I mean, I'm gonna show you very quickly how you can uh, just do some very uh, small experiment yourself. Okay, but that's okay. You know, some of you already realized maybe there was a little bit uh, uh, intuitively maybe some confusion there. But let's take a look. I think it's worth uh, uh, pointing to you very quickly. But you can redo this example yourself uh, later. And of course, you don't really just want to memorize that it should be a conjunction because maybe for those of you who thought this junction might also work, but not too sure why. I was, I'm going to show you why. Okay, so now this is the correct version. Okay, so first of all, this is the correct version. And this one here is incorrect. Okay, let's see why. Okay, I'm just give, gonna give you a simple example over here. Let's see the simple example here. Let's say we wanna calculate WP. Let's say we got two variables in scope, X and Y. We say that if Y is larger than zero, we're going to increment X. Otherwise, we'll decrement X. Okay, let's say that's what we have, right? Let me just go, uh, okay, that's a Boolean condition over here. And then either we go for case one or we go for case two. Okay, let's say we do that, right? So now, how can we calculate the WP? Let's say we chose the wrong version, and then we'll see how we can end up in a scenario where it's actually not right. Okay, let's uh, take a look very quickly, okay? I'll try to make it clear, so later on, if you want to study for yourself for this example here, you can do that by looking at the recording. So now, let's talk about the if branch. For the if branch over here, we're gonna increment under the assumption that Y is larger than zero. So we're gonna say it's going to be WP for X incremented to establish X larger than or equal to zero. Under the assumption that Y is larger than zero. Oh, sorry, let me just write it more properly. Under the assumption that Y is larger than zero. Okay, and then we're also going to do the else branch, which is here, so now, it will be the WP for X is assigned to X minus one. And then we want to establish the same post condition, X larger than or equal to zero. And then under the assumption that Y larger than zero is not the case. So I'll just simply say Y less than or equal to zero, right? The negation of larger than will be less than or equal to. And then we say that we're gonna try the wrong choice. Okay, so now I'm gonna put a disjunction over here is an or. So that's a wrong version I can tell you first of all, okay? So now, before I try to do anything else, let me just uh, tell you something. How can we disprove that this rule is really inappropriate? How can we do that? So what I will do is, let me just uh, highlight it and then tell you how we can uh, think about it. Let's say we have this particular WP over here, right? So now we want to say this. Okay, so now we want to see some counter example, okay? So the WP over here should not evaluate to true if and input value can violate the post condition. Okay, let me let me ex uh, explain to you. I'll just write it down uh, what I'm gonna do. But let me just tell you. Uh, let me just illustrate to you. Okay. So now we're going to think about some cases. Here I got some cases for you. Okay. Let's say if I simply got this particular program. Okay, so now if you think about it, let's see this. If I simply got the following, okay? If you think about this particular program, first of all, intuitively. Intuitively. Should this program be correct?
That's the first question intuitively. Well, I can tell you that this program itself is actually not correct because you are saying that, th thinking this way, for the implementation, you can either try to increment x or you may try to decrement x, depending on what the value is for y. However, for both cases, because at the runtime, you might go through the if branch or you might go through the else branch. For both cases, you want to establish x larger than or equal to zero, right? So now a question for you. Like, let me get some counter example for you. Let's say when you consider y is equal to one and also x is equal to minus four, okay? Think about this. At the runtime, what's gonna happen? At the runtime, if you got y is equal to one over here, so y is equal to one is going to go to the if branch. In that case, you're going to say x is incremented by one. But what if the current value for x is actually minus four? In that case, minus four plus one is going to be minus three. And now when you go ahead and evaluate this particular post condition, it's going to be a post condition violation, right? First of all, okay? Okay, for those of you who might got lost a little bit, Okay, I'll try to, uh, I need to stu still need to go on unless you got a very specific question for me. But I'm just trying to explain to you why using disjunction over here is incorrect, okay? So now this particular counter example, y equals one and x equals minus four. When y is equal to one and x equals minus four, minus four plus one, and now in this case, you're going to get minus three larger than or equal to zero, that's going to be a post condition violation. Post condition violation, which means there's at least one case where your program might crash because of post condition violation. However, notice the following. When we calculate the WP over here, even though there is at least one case that is going to give you the crash. However, the WP, I can tell you that mistakenly, WP will still evaluate to true. Why is that? And it really has to do with this particular disjunction. Okay, let me highlight what I just said and then I'll let you, I'll pause maybe just for 10 seconds, right? Mistakenly, uh, let me just uh, make this properly highlighted, okay? Mistakenly, WP will still be, will still evaluate to true. But now my question is how exactly? How would WP in this case? Well, if you see that over here, Y larger than zero, right? When Y is equal to one. one uh, so that'll be one larger than zero. So that will give you true. So true implies, and now what's the WP for, for this particular guy, right? I can tell you that it, does, it doesn't really quite matter. Okay, if you try to calculate WP, certainly try to do that, okay? But I can tell you that it doesn't quite matter. The WP overall will just be true anyway. Can anybody see why? Okay. Yes, false implies anything to true. You're basically, uh, Randir, thank you. You're basically talking about the else branch. Okay, let me uh, enlighten everybody who may not have got it, okay? So now let's say when I, Y is equal to one and X equals minus four. So now when we evaluate this particular right-hand side of this disjunction, it's an imprecation. So now y would be one less than or equal to zero, right? That's the y value. So this part would just be false. And we know very well from 1090, false implies anything will just be true. So that means this part over here, no matter what, is just going to be true. And then true or anything will just be true, okay? So now overall, the WP will always be true. So now if you simply use this particular rule, the WP will just be true, always. So that's not gonna be very useful. So instead, what you really wanna do is use conjunction. And the conjunction really means the if branch establish, establishes the WP, oh sorry, the if branch establishes the post condition R, 
and the else branch also uh, the else branch so if branch and else branch also establishes R okay so these are the two things you want to keep in mind okay guys any question it's quite a quite a bit of illustration over here, but you know it's recorded. I would suggest for those of you who really want to know a hundred percent about why we should really choose a uh, conjunction as opposed to disjunction. There's a theor uh, some theory behind. You want to get uh, get understood. Okay. Any questions? Okay, that's about the if conditional. Okay. Let me just go a little bit further back to the slides. Okay, so that's the uh, rule that we just talked about. Should be conjunction. And then, uh, so these are just, uh, let me, for this one here, let me uh, just uh, show you very quickly on the slides, uh, on the iPad, okay? So this one here is basically saying the following. So I'm gonna leave these pages clean, rather clean, so you can also look at them. So these are like a summary of the proof rules. Then later on, if you wanna do your own program verification on the paper, these are the rules you want to refresh yourself about, okay? So now, if I look at the WP here, uh, let me see this one particularly, right? This one is saying the following. In order to prove, let's say here, okay, in order to prove, if I say Q over here, okay, that's a, that's a starting point. And then I say, if B is true, I'm going to do S1. Otherwise, when B is not true, I'm going to do S2. Upon the termination, I'm going to establish R. So these are the contracts over here. So let me just tell you, there are two ways you can actually prove this particular program is correct, okay? So there are two ways to proving correctness. Okay, I'm gonna show you, uh, just sketch the two ways, right? Number one, uh, which I'm gonna follow mostly uh, for the rest of the lecture, okay? Number one, you can do either one. Number one, I'm simply just gonna apply the WP rule that we talk about, right? So WP for this particular one, calculate the WP for this, okay? So it would be, okay, uh, the WP for if, the, the if program over here, the one I just, uh, circ, uh, the one I just uh, highlight, and for that one to establish R, I can calculate the WP. We're gonna see one example very, very soon. And then I want to make sure the original precondition is no weaker. So now, just do that, okay? Number one is to prove, to prove this. Okay, that's number approach number one. Approach number two is, you can somehow think about, there are indeed two separate whole triples that we can discharge. One is, if we are trying to do the if branch, if we do the if branch, we know that before, uh, before we try to execute S1, we know that for sure B is true. And also the uh, program's precondition must be true as well. So you can think about it's like a Q, the program's precondition to start with. And also since we go to the if branch, so it will be B is true. And then by executing S1, we are going to establish R. So this is basically if branch, okay? And then we want to make sure the else branch also works. In that case, let me uh, use another, let me use purple. So now in order to prove the else branch, Again, with uh, the, the starting point is the same, okay? Let me just uh, try to make sure it's actually tell you there's two possibilities. The starting point will still be Q. But now if we go to the else part, so that means B was evaluated to false. So that'll be end, not B. If we go to the else part, so that means S2 will be executed. And then the same post condition R should be established. So you can see there are two whole triples. You can either use approach number one or approach number two. Approach number one is to calculate the WP for the overall if then else, and then try to prove the original uh, Q is no weaker than that using imprecation. That's approach number one. Approach number two, you can split the whole if statement over here into two or triple as I just explained to you, and then make sure they're conjoined together. Okay, and it's a very quick uh, go uh, walkthrough of the rule. And then we'll do examples. So now uh, this will be, uh, there's another example here. So just about this guy here, let's say we want to do this particular program, okay? I'm gonna uh, save a little, a little bit of time. You can see in some way it's not so fair 
to really expect you to really understand how to prove this program here right away. Because even though we got assignments over here, you can see we, uh, basically this program here, I'm not sure if you can see what we're trying to do here. Okay, anybody? Okay, we're basically trying to figure out the maximum of the two numbers, right? Given X and Y, we want to see which one is maximum, call it bigger, and which one is minimum, call it smaller. Okay, that's basically a program. We don't prove it correct. In order to prove it correct, we can actually go for either of the approaches you have. Okay, so here is basically what you can apply just by what, what I just said uh, in, the, in this particular uh, slide over here. Okay, you can do either of the two approaches. Apparently, the one I show on the slides is actually approach number two. Okay, I'm gonna show you for approach number two, you can do that. I'll show you approach number one as well. And then I'll tell you why you're, you're not ready to do that just yet. Okay, approach number one, if I got this one over here, how do I prove it? Okay, to prove this particular program either correct or incorrect, follow two steps. Okay, so basically given any program, you always have to follow two steps. Okay, step number one. Step number one, calculate the WP for, okay, let me be, again, let me just sketch a little bit for you. You can think about this part over here is your implementation. Okay, let me just call this S over here. WP for S to establish bigger larger than or equal to smaller. I'll say B larger than or equal to S. Bigger, uh, larger than or equal to smaller, right? Let's uh, just go up to there just for now. And then what will be the second step? Step number two, uh, step number two will be once we calculate the WP from step number one, we're going to make sure the original precondition is no weaker than that. Proof that the original precondition x larger than zero and y larger than zero implies whatever WP that you will actually calculate. Okay, I'll just put it here. It's a placeholder because it's still sub subject to your calculation. But now let me just go a little bit further for the first step, okay? If I go a little bit further, you can see, now how, do, how can we actually uh, do it, okay? So now I can say, uh, I'm going to follow it's going to be, okay, the way to simplify this is to say by the WP rule for conditionals. Okay, so how do we do that? Okay, again, in order to do that, you know that you have to really uh, think about two branches, right? Let me again highlight the two branches. Either we say X larger than Y, in that case, I'm gonna execute this. And the second case, the second case would be, when x, so now think about x is smaller than or equal to y, the negation case. In that case, this should be executed, right? So now let me just write it down very quickly. So now I'm going to say over here, I'm gonna put it here, right? The answer, let's put it here. So now we would say under the assumption that x is larger than y, we want to make sure the WP for here, bigger is assigned to x followed by smaller is assigned to y and that one there is going to establish bigger larger than or equal to smaller right let me just uh, make a little bit more space so i can write more properly okay so that's going to be bigger larger than or equal to smaller okay that's the uh, first branch and then the second branch will be in a very similar way so now under the assumption that x is less than or equal to y, that should really entail. The WP, okay, so now I just follow this particular implementation. Bigger is assigned to y, followed by the smaller is assigned to x. And then the same post condition must be satisfied. So b larger than or equal to s. And now as we learned before, it should be a conjunction, okay? So now think about this is the result that you will get for step number one. And then, so this is going to be what you have to fill in to the uh, question mark, question mark. 
And then for step number two, you will simply have to prove that this particular part here will actually establish this part over here, which is the orange box. Okay, guys, it's a very quick sketch of the proof, right? Hopefully that's in general still clear. Okay, any questions? Okay, so now the problem is, the problem really is, how do you deal with, for example, this sequential composition here, and also this particular sequential composition here? So that's the main obstacle that we haven't really got through yet. Okay, so that's something I would like to talk about now to see how you can calculate for sequential composition. So now let's take a look. Now for sequential composition, okay, we're gonna do one example altogether, but now I would like to go over some rule together with you. How do we calculate for sequential composition? Okay, so for sequential composition, okay, over here, uh, the rule is already on the slides. It, maybe you already had a look at that, but I want to give you some intuition, which is always important. So now if I want to calculate the WP, let's say this. If I want to calculate the WP for, let's say S1 followed by S2, and then I want to establish some post condition R. So this is my goal right now, right? The way to think about this is, oh, by the way, so S1 can be arbitrarily complicated. It could be a simple loop followed by another simple loop, or it can be some nested if statements followed by another nested if statements, right? Can be arbitrary for S1 and S2. The way to think about this is, you want to think about conceptually, upon the termination of S1 and before the execution for S2, right? Think about this is, like an intermediate state over here. So this is when S1 terminates. And also this is right before, right before S1 is executed, right? Agree? So this is like an intermediate state. Of course, this state usually is hidden, right? You don't really see that, but that's conceptually how you can think of it. So now, how can we calculate WP? When we actually talk about this particular WP over here, when you say the WP here, make it a little bit bigger. When you think about this particular WP, you're saying that after executing S1 followed by S2, after the whole thing, I want to establish R. However, why don't we try to split the problem a little bit, divide and concur? What we can think about is, in order to do that, of course, in order to really make sure R is eventually satisfied, what would be the next statement that's going to be executed by this program? S2. Because S2 is phase two. You can think about S1 is phase one. S2 is phase two. So now, why don't we try to think in the following way? If I know what would be the weakest precondition for S2 to establish R, I can definitely calculate the weakest precondition for that, right? To see what will be the weakest precondition for S2 to establish R. If I know what it is, that condition there should be exactly the termination condition for S1, right? And then if I know the orange, and then I can calculate what I can, I can calculate in turn, what is the weakest precondition, and then for S1 to establish this particular weakest precondition, okay? Guys, I hopefully you're following me, right? So now let's just take a look. The orange one, uh, I'm just gonna write it down first. The orange one over here, you can see, I want to calculate this part here, that's phase two. So I want to know what's the WP for S2 to establish R, okay? You can think about this is like a phase two. And now this phase two will actually tell you if phase two was the last statement to be executed in order to establish R. So the starting point for the phase two should be WP of this. And then in order for S1 to go right before S2, because that's the execution order. So now in order to do that, uh, what I need to do is I'm going to make sure in order for S1 to be executed and upon the termination for S1, 
upon termination of S1, I want to make sure the orange one is actually satisfied. Okay, so let me just get rid of this particular thing here. You can think about this particular uh, condition here, WP here. This is something that upon the termination of S1, that has to be uh, uh, that has to be uh, established. So now, you, in order to see how how that can happen, I would say the WP over here for S1 to establish this. Guys, any questions? Let me just, uh, before you ask any question, maybe you're fine, okay? Let me just uh, do one more uh, visual uh, illustration for you very quickly. I know that S1 is going to be executed, and then there will be some intermediate states over here, and then after that, I'm going to execute S2. After S2, there will be another resulting states, right? So now, basically, we want to know what this is and what this is. That's basically the critical thing for you to understand the weakest precondition. So now, for this guy here, for this particular one, uh, we know that this is R, right? That's just given. So that one's uh, very easy, okay? That one's very easy. And then, what would be this particular one here? So this one will just be the WP for S2 to establish R. So now, we actually already reduced the size of the problem. Because now, rather than considering two statements, now we can just consider just S1 and also this particular terminating condition for S1 to establish. So now, what would be the weakest big condition just right before S1? So now, this one here would just be the WP for S1 to establish exactly this condition over here. Okay, any questions? Okay, I hopefully uh, that my goal for this uh, illustration here just to give you the intuition. I think that's the most important thing because uh, there will be, as I said in the beginning, I may not be able to go over every single detail with you in the lecture today. We got very limited time, but at least I can give you enough intuition. So when you study the slide, it should be self-contained enough for you to go on. Okay. Okay, that's about the sequential composition. Okay, and I think we better do a example very quickly. And then we have to move on to loops and then try to give you, uh, again, some information there. Okay, if we go to sequential composition over here, again, there's a rule, okay? That's something we just talked about. And then we want to do example over here. Okay, how do we prove that? Okay, you can apparently see that this is just a swap program, okay? How can we prove it, okay? Okay, let me just uh, try to... Uh, talk about it very quickly. How can we uh, do this proof over here? Okay, so now there will be, uh, as we said before, in order to prove it, you need two steps over here. To prove it, step number one, I'm going to use approach number two. Okay, oh, remember with, uh, sorry, approach number one. We talk about two approaches, I'm going to use approach number one. So step one, calculates calculates over here. So we basically got the implementation here. One, two, and also three, okay? So that'll be the temp is assigned to X, X is assigned to Y, and also Y is assigned to temp. And at the end, we should really establish, I'll just write the same color, X larger than Y. Step number one is to calculate the WP. And step number two, whatever we actually calculate, make sure true implies that, right? Of course, if we simply put the original post condition to be false, no need to prove because false implies anything. At the same time, it's useless, right? Okay, let's see very quickly. How do we calculate this? Again, you want to think a little bit uh, uh, big picture. Well, how do we divide that into uh, intermediate states? So I'm gonna outline how I'm gonna do that, right? Think about, we're going to basically execute, uh, we're going to execute this particular, this will be the first stage, right? In order for that one to, re it should be terminating in a particular state that will be sufficiently uh, weak, that'll be sufficiently uh, strong, sorry, that'll be, sufficient, that'll be sufficient in order for the remaining part over here to establish this particular post condition, right? So what I will do is I'm going to just highlight this part here. Okay, so there's a reason for that, okay? And then when I look at this particular uh, 
stuff over here, right? This particular one. You can see that one also can be subdivided into two phases. The first phase, x is assigned to y. The second phase, y is assigned to temp. In that case, you can see the intermediate state is really over here, okay? So that means after x is assigned to y, it terminates, it should be enough in order for this particular program of in order for x is y is assigned to temp to establish y x larger than y, okay? So, so now for that one there, I'm also going to do uh, another color. Let's say I do green. Okay, so now let's see how we can follow this particular logical order. I just outlined this proof order. Okay, let's see how we can do that, okay? So now, calculate the WP. Okay, let me just see, calculate, I forgot to write WP here. Calculate the WP, okay, just in case. So now, how do we calculate that? First of all, we're gonna say it's equal to, okay, so by the definition of WP for the sequential composition, right? So now let's uh, just copy this guy here. So WWP for temp is assigned to X and the ending states for temp is assigned to X should be enough to establish the orange part. The orange part would be basically for X is assigned to Y and Y is assigned to temp to establish this. So that'll be just another WP. For the WP for X is assigned to Y and also followed by y is assigned to temp and for this one here to establish x larger than y okay okay hopefully so far so good and now i'm just going oh, okay i'm just going to be careful with the space okay and then how do we uh, do a little bit further we just need one more application of the rule for wp and then we will be ready to do some simplification and the next one here would be, we want to look at y is assigned to temp, right? So now basically you want to make sure for this particular one, after executing this, we want to make sure the intermediate states is good enough for this particular last stage to establish the post condition, right? So now how do we do that? So what I will do is, let me just get rid of that. So that will be equal to, okay, let me go back to the color here. It will be just another definition definition of WP for sequential composition. And now I'll simply say WP, and now, so this part remained the same. Temp is assigned to X, and then this part here just the same, so WP for X is assigned to Y, and now it has to establish this particular part, right? Hopefully you can see that. For the last part here to establish x larger than equal to y. So that one there would just be another WP for y is assigned to temp to establish x larger than y, okay? So now this will be one green, one orange, and also one blue, okay? Okay, so hopefully you haven't really got completely lost, I hope. At least you can see uh, the big picture, what, what I'm trying to do over here. Okay, let me just go a little bit. Uh, okay, let me just try to make a little bit more space so you can actually see the whole thing. Okay, so now how can we simplify them, right? So now what you gotta do is to really apply the rule for assignments. So now you can see here, uh, try to look at this for the green one, let's do one by one. If I try, if I try to simplify this one specifically, you can see I should replace every free occurrence of y by temp, okay? So what I should do now is I should really try to do, uh, let me just try uh, the green, okay? So now I can say definition of WP for assignments, okay? So now how do we do that, right? Hopefully now I can just do very easy substitution, right? Basically that one there would be, uh, y would be replaced by temp. So that should be x larger than temp. And everything else I should just copy, right? So th this WP, we haven't got it yet. So I would say WP for x is assigned to y to establish that. And also for this part here, it remained the same. So W the WP for temp is assigned to x to establish that. 
Okay, so now what should we simplify the next? We should simplify this guy here, right? So now I will say also by the definition of WP for the assignments. Okay, I believe I can really just try to make everything a little bit smaller so I can complete the calculation for you. So this will be might be the only example we can do uh, in four details in class. Okay, let me just make it a little bit smaller just to be safe. Okay, so now let's do the orange one, right? For the orange one here, it's now going to be every free occurrence of x is going to be replaced by y. So that, what do we get? So that'll be y larger than temp, right? And the blue one will just be the same, the blue one here. So that'll be the WP for temp is assigned to x to establish this. Okay, so far so good. Okay, so now how can we complete it? So now you can see every free occurrence of temp should be replaced by x. So this should be replaced by x. One more time. Definition of WP for assignments. So now I'm going to replace every free occurrence of temp over here by x. So that'll be y larger than x. So now this is a final outcome for us. You can see even though it's a simple swap program, but to really get a proof right, it will take quite a bit of, uh, you really got to do it carefully. Okay, so now this is the final weakest precondition. Okay, so this is the final outcome we have for this particular one. But now we have to do second step. So step number two, okay, is to make sure the actual precondition over here true okay true actually implies proof or disapprove that y larger than or equal to x okay so now is is the case okay is does true implies y larger than x always well you actually talk about in 1090 okay i will just mention the rule in 1090 by it's called identity identity of imprecation. If you say true implies something, then it should be just something itself. Okay, it's by identity. So I'll refer you to 1090. Okay, so now y larger than x is really eventually something we want to prove. Is y larger than x is a theorem? Is it or is it not? Okay, some of you already said no. Okay, uh, okay. This is not a tautology, or it's not a theory. Negative, it is not. So now, in order to prove that, well, in order to do that, well, you can just give me one counter example. For example, well, you're saying that in order for this particular swap program to always, uh, because I know I'm gonna swap X and Y, if in the post states, it should be x larger than y. In the pre state, it should be the reverse, right? It makes sense, right? But counter example. Okay, I'll put the counter example here. So counter example. I would say any case where it is not this particular uh, weakest precondition we want to satisfy. Any x, y that satisfy Satisfying, not a case. Okay, for example, what about simply, let's say y is equal to three and x is equal to four. Okay, so now if you do that, so after the swap, you will actually, uh, after the swap, x larger than y will simply not be the case. Okay, so guys, I'm going, uh, sorry, I gotta go a little bit of fast over here, but hopefully you can see the big picture here. And you really want to pay attention to the to the details over here. I try to be as complete as possible. Okay. Any quick question for me before I go on? Okay. No questions. Okay. So now I think we are now done with uh, sequential composition. We are now done with assignments and also alternation conditionals. I got about twenty four minutes. Uh, I really don't want to run over time. I will see as much as I can cover. Okay, I'll see as much as I can do. So now, uh, maybe for, for those, uh, so here's the thing. 
right? I know that we have one exam uh, that's an option for you to complete the course. For those of you, I, I would say, uh, let me in, before I go on, right? Because I know I only got 20 minutes, so I need to be realistic, okay? At the end, there will be an exam, online exam, right? Given the current disruption, we have one, ex oh, sorry, iPad. We have one exam over there. For those of you who have to study the exam, okay, I would say either if you decide that you will take the exam, of course, you have to study everything that we cover in the course. Even if you decide not to take the exam, I would still urge you to actually uh, study the topics because all the topics we cover in this course, originally it should be examined by some, um, uh, some a comprehensive sit-in exam, but now we cannot really do it because of the current situation. So I would say either you decide to take the exam or decide not to take the exam. I would say it's also still quite important for you to study the topics for this proof. So what I will do is I will see what I can do for the remaining about 20 minutes. I'll see as, uh, as much as I can. And then I'll refer you to some maybe a previous recording for my lecture. So you can also refer to them. You can also ask me questions later. Okay, that'll be the, the plan we have to arrange. Okay. Okay, so let me try to do as much as I can for uh, the loops. Let's see how much we can do. Okay, that's a sequential composition we have. And then for the loops over here. A, okay, the, this is just a background for the loop. Right? You can just look at a uh, very easy background. Okay, uh, the conclusion is loop is very difficult to get right. You might get different kinds of uh, infinite loop. I've seen a lot in your lab test. And also you might get one off loop maybe the loop counter was not maintained properly. So there are many things you want to watch out for. Okay, and then uh, in your textbook for OSSC2, uh, they actually show that there were four pop, at least four published versions for, for the binary search, and they're all wrong because they didn't do verification formally properly. So just to tell you that whenever you do your algorithm that actually involve a loop or loops, you have to pay attention to correctness condition for your loop. Okay, so now let me just try to do as much as I can, okay? How do we prove that the following loops are actually correct, right? So that's the syntax for the loops in iPhone. So now you got some initial condition, you got condition here, and I want to draw a very quick comparison to the loops in Java or in the C-like family language. Okay, so now let's take a look, okay? I'll just give you one very quick example. So whenever we talk about this condition here, this is called the exit condition. And this condition over here, not B, I, I put the negation here for a reason. Not B will be so-called state condition. So later on, when you actually study a new programming language, your loops might be specified using either the exit or the state condition. Either one, is, it should be, uh, they should be equivalent, or they should be, logically convertible to each other. Okay, just give you one example. If I say from, let's say i is assigned to one until i is equal to, oh, actually, that should be a Boolean condition. i is equal to 10. And then I would say loop and then n. Of course, I would say i is assigned to i plus one. Okay, of course, I might simply try to print I. Now, first of all, convince yourself, how many iterations do we, how many values of I are we going to print out in terms of I for how many values? Should it be 10 values or fewer values or more values that we should print out for this particular case? Okay, very good. Only nine values because as soon as I is equal to 10, we're going to exit, right? So that'll be from one to nine. So now in order to convert that into the corresponding uh, loops in uh, Java, let's say for example, what you will do is you're gonna say while, okay, before that I would say integer, for example, i is initialized to be one. And then while, let's say over here, it is not the case that i is equal to 10. While it is not the case, I'm not gonna exit just, uh, while it is not, uh, so while it is not the case, for example, I could be one, could be two, etc. I'm gonna stay in the loop. And then over here, I can say I plus plus, and then print I. It's a very quick illustration to show that these two conditions, conceptually, they are simply the opposite. So logically, 
this one will just be the negation of the other. Okay, it's a very quick uh, comparison, so don't get confused. But for our purpose, we're going to focus on uh, just the Eiffel syntax, just for uh, the, this lecture here. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about how in order to prove the correctness of loops, we have to write contracts about the loops. How do we do that? Okay, so now in order to do that, we're going to talk about the syntax for the contract for the loops. We still got the initialization part, and also we got invariants. So now you can see invariant is somewhere we put different from the class invariant, right? We put it inside a loop. So we got some invariant here, which means for every iteration, we're going to maintain this particular loop invariants. Oh, well, we'll get there, okay? Invariant should be Boolean condition, and also until as soon as this particular condition B is true, we're gonna exit from the loop. And also we got the body of the loop, which is gonna repeat for as many times when necessary. And also the variance. And notice that invariance does not worry about anything about termination. On the other hand, the variance over here is a way to measure the progress of your loop. So remember we talk about proving for total correctness of program. You have to prove number one, separation concern. You wanna prove number one, uh, termination. Um, number two, Assuming termination, we're going to prove that the program is going to establish the post condition. So this will apply to the loops uh, directly. So now for the case of the loop, for variance is for you to actually prove about termination. Okay, it's integer expression. You can think about the, uh, the variance over here, basically thinking this way. The idea about loop variance Very easy to illustrate. Let's say this. So let's think about this. If you think about uh, over here, the uh, y-axis is simply just the value of loop variance, okay? Which is an integer expression. And then the x-axis is simply the number of iterations iteration number, basically. You can think about this is iteration one, at the end of iteration one, at the end of iteration two, at the end of iteration three. And then you can think about at the end of iteration one, your loop variant might start with certain value over here. And then the rule uh, in order for the variant to be satisfied is you want to make sure after every iteration, the value for the loop variance must be strictly decreasing, right? So now, a strictly decreasing, for example, uh, let's say, think about, if in the beginning you got V0, let's say uh, variant V0, and then at the end of the first iteration, you got V. So now what should be the equation here? It should be V, the new value should be strictly less than V0. And it should be the same up about every iteration. So eventually what you will see is, it's guaranteed, you're going to get a curve like this which means you are, guar you are guaranteed every time when you try to uh, move with one more iteration for your loop, you're getting closer to zero, right? You can think about this is special value for zero. And then eventually, okay, when you touch, when V is equal to zero, so that would mean your loop terminates. So this is actually one standard way of measuring uh, for loop termination, because you know that, Every, uh, okay, between iterations, between iterations, value of loop variance should be decreasing strictly. So that's why, so event, so you're basically bounded by the value of V, the, the initial value. So that will, uh, that will put an upper bound on the number of iterations you have for your loop. So it's not unbounded, okay? It's always bounded. It's a very quick uh, intuition for loop variance. And for those of you who actually took uh, what is taking 30, 3101, you also learned about the looping variance, right? We'll talk about just a very specific form for the looping variance today, okay? I got about 15 minutes. I'll see how much I can do. I'll do as much as I can. And then let's go back to here. Okay, we got invariants over here. We also got variant over here, right? Over here. So you can read it. It's actually self-contained. We're gonna talk about how you can, when you try to calculate using a loop, 
the maximum of the uh, the values in the array. How can we do that, right? So now I think uh, for the remaining part, uh, let me do do, do do the following, okay? What I should do is, let me just give you the simplest example to really uh, talk about how are the contracts for the loops are going to be checked. I also gave you this particular example on the uh, lecture site. You can also download the code and try it out to see how you can reproduce the looping variant error in order to understand it better. Okay, so now let's take a look. So this is our syntax for the loops, right? So that's initialization part. And then we're just going to execute the initialization part just for once, right? And then we're going to check the looping variance. This is looping variance. So now you can see the looping variance is actually going to be checked for the first time. Check for the first time before the first iteration. Okay, it's gonna be checked for the first time. So after the in, in, uh, initialization, you're, uh, you're not going to check uh, basically to make sure uh, after initialization, if the invariance is actually not satisfied, you're going to get loop invariant violation. If the invariant is actually satisfied, so that means you have a potential to actually enter the first iteration, but you don't know because you don't know whether the exit condition over here is true or false, right? So now once the invariant is established for the very first time, you can now check to see whether the exit condition is true or not. If the exit condition is actually true, that means you want to exit from the loop. Otherwise, you can go ahead and try to go into the iteration, right? For the body of the iteration. And now the only thing left is about how to check the variance, right? As I said before, the way to think about loop variant is we try to use an integer to bound the number of iterations for your loop. So now, if you look at that, upon the termination, okay, it's thinking this way. So, so this is checked the first time at the end of the first iteration. You simply check at the end. Okay, so now for v less than zero over here, uh, which means your loop area actually falls below this particular boundary, so that's not allowed. So if you find that if your variant actually decreases below zero, it's going to be loop variance violation. Okay. On the other hand, if your loop variance is actually uh, larger than zero, that means you're okay. So you go back to the beginning of your loop, and then the process goes on. Okay. It's a very quick uh, go uh, walkthrough of how you can check the contracts, specifically uh, for invariants and also for variants. How you can check contracts for your loop. Okay, any questions about how you can check uh, contracts for your loops? Any questions? All right. So now I got about ten minutes. Uh, let's see this. Oh, what if what if the variant doesn't change? Right. Remember this diagram over here. We say that between the iterations, value of loop, var uh, loop variance. Oh, I should notice I got a typo here. So now it should be loop variance should be decreasing, okay? So now if it is not decreasing, if it simply stay the same, right? For example, if you think about, if, you, you, if your curve goes like this, maybe it will simply get decreasing and then it stay flat. So there's no guarantee anymore if your loop will ever terminate, right? It will, call, it will definitely cause a violation, yes. So you want to make sure whatever variant expression you choose must be uh, strictly decreasing. Yes, it's a very good question, okay? If loop variant, oh, let me write it, uh, let me down uh, on the other one. Okay, so now it's not exactly set over here, but now let's say this. It's a very important point to make. So now, if V does not decrease 
also loop variance violations over here. Okay. All right. Let's now do the following. Uh, let me tell you the, the rest. We got about nine minutes, right? I'm, time's really ticking. So I would suggest the following. I'm going to go over a very simple example with you. And then I will just tell you in order to study the rest of the slides, either for your exam or for your learning. So th those are the points you want to pay attention to. A again, if you got trouble of understanding the materials, uh, you can get back, uh, get in touch with me. And also I will refer you to some previous semester recording. I think they're also clear. Okay, but let me just, uh, I got nine minutes. Okay, so now in order to give you a little bit more example, let me talk about a very simple loop over here, a very simple one. Let's say this is a loop I got over here. Okay, let me just spend about a few minutes to talk about talk about it very quickly. How do we trace this particular loop? Okay, you can see I initialized to be one. In invariant should be I should be always between one and also six inclusive. We exit from the loop as as soon as I is larger than five. Namely, I when I reaches six, we're going to uh, exit from the loop. And also every time we're just going to print out the iteration number over here and also increment i each time. And then the variant is just going to be six minus i. Okay. Let me just trace the very beginning with together with you. Okay. So now let's see this. After the initialization part, which is over here, okay. So now in this case, we know that i is equal to one. When i is equal to one, we know that we're going to satisfy this particular variant, right? One is between one and six. So now that means in this particular one, looping variance is established. In that case, we're just going to go into the body of the, uh, go to check to see whether we are going to go for the very first iteration. So the next one to check will be the exit condition. So now let's see this. For exit condition, one larger than five would be false, right? So now that means we are not exiting yet. So now we are going to go into the very first iteration. And then we're going to uh, increment the value of i. In that case, we're going to, let's say, execute this particular line over here. So now i will be incremented from one to two, okay? So now after this, i will be actually equal to two, okay? So now what we need to do is to check to see the variant value. Okay, the variant value over here is going to be six minus i. So now it's going to be six minus two, which will be equal to four. So now four is four logic uh, less than zero will just be false. So we don't really have the loop variant violation. So what we'll do is we're going to go back to the beginning of the loop. Okay, and then we're going to keep going. Okay, so now I have a very quick question for you. Okay. So now, how many iterations should we have in this case? Hopefully that's quite easy for you, right? How many iterations should be? Anybody? How many iterations should we have? I'm just gonna point out something to you. Okay, five iterations, very good. Okay, so now let's see this. Because now we know that I is, uh, as soon as I, Guess to six, we exit. So that means over here for the iteration, I would just be equal to one, two, three, four, and five. And after five is incremented to six, we're gonna exit. So six is never used in the body of the loop, okay? And then I think uh, that one I just show you uh, one iteration where how how the, uh, how the looping variant and variant are going to be checked. And then I would suggest try to go a little bit further with the diagram, and then to see how exactly how the looping var uh, how the looping variant and variant are going to be checked. One final thing to to show you. Okay, so now when you try to do this, so after uh, okay one two three four five, and then when i is equal to six, so that means we are now ready to exit. Right, that's gonna be the last value to be checked, and now when i is equal to six. And if you try to look at this variant over here, okay, the last time loop variant is checked. 
In that case, we're going to use the value of 6, right? That's actually right after the last iteration, 5 is, in, five is incremented to 6. So now you will get 6 minus 6, which will just be 0. Okay? All right. So, uh, guys, any question about this very simple example? I would say this, uh, this very contrived example, but that one just mainly to show you how you can simulate the uh, runtime monitoring of your loop contracts. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Let me uh, just tell you, okay, I think uh, I only got about a few minutes. Okay. I'm just going to tell you how you can do some self-study for the rest of the topics. I think they are all important. We just didn't have time to really finish them uh, thoroughly in the class. But again, I'm, I'll refer you to some reference. You can also refer them to. Okay, this is a diagram for uh, how the loops work just visually, okay? And what I would suggest is, uh, this is just one more case study for your particular, for your, um, there's one more case study for looping variant and variance. That one there is about calculating, uh, finding the maximum value from an array, okay? So now what I want you to pay attention to is this particular one. For the looping variance, we want to make sure this one here, if I say for every j, uh, i is a loop, uh, i is the actually loop counter. We're saying uh, j should be between lower and the current value of i. And now we want to say the result is larger than or equal to a j. Okay, it looks fine intuitively. However, it turns out this is a looping variant that's actually not accurate. Especially the equal sign here is actually shouldn't be there. It should be a dot lower less than or equal to j and less than i. That should be the correct looping variant. If you study the slides and maybe watch my recording uh, in the previous semester, you will see why, okay? I just wanna point out to you, that's the main point to understand. And then the remaining part until the last part will be just about the example. You can also look at the tracing over here. I also included uh, uh, all the details for you. Okay, one final thing to point out about verifying loops is, since now we got a contract for the loop, so now we can verify the correctness for the loops. What you want to see is this, okay? So this is still the same example. And this is one exercise for you if you want to practice more about looping variance and variance. And then how do you prove the correctness for the loop? Let's say this, you try to have, you have a loop, you have some starting points, you have some ending point you want to establish. How can you prove it? It turns out in order to prove the correctness of the loop, you can generate five different so-called proof obligations, like a five different conditions to prove. You have to prove each one of them. You can see in the case of assignments, alternation, sequential composition, you only got two steps to prove, right? But now for the uh, correctness of the loops, you have to split them into different whole triples, basically, okay? So these are the different conditions you have to prove about, I'll just go over them with you very quickly, informally. Okay, so now you want to make sure given the precondition Q, the initialization over here will establish the looping variance even before the very first iteration. And at the end of each iteration, uh, if you are not ready to exit just yet, you're going to maintain the looping variant, which means let's say at the end of the first iteration, if you check your looping variant again, it should be maintained, okay? It should be true for every iteration. And then, so now let's say this, if the looping variant have been maintained and now you're ready to exit, which means maybe you have done 10 iterations already. So that would mean the fact that the looping variant has been maintained and also you are now ready to exit, the post condition should be entailed, should be satisfied, okay? We're gonna formulate each one of these. And also when the loop, uh, how do we uh, verify about termination? So that's about the variance. Basically the two things that we talked about before. You want to make sure it's not negative. It's always larger than or equal to zero, the loop variant value. And also you want to make sure it is uh, strictly decreasing, okay? So these are the five conditions given any loop over here, like this general structure. You want to make sure these five conditions are proved separately, okay? I'm also gonna give you one exercise about proving something uh, like this, and then you can actually do some exercise over there. Okay, so these are simply just, you can see, for example, this one here, this is the whole triple for proving given the precondition before the loop and also the uh, initialization part for the loop, you want to establish a looping variant, right? That's just one whole triple. So these are the five conditions you're gonna prove. I already explained to you informally, but I'm not gonna prove them formally, okay? 
And then for the rest of the uh, the slides, it's just uh, outline. For this particular example over here, right? You can see you have a loop over here, and then you got some post condition, okay? That uh, the result is a maximum. And also, let's say there's no precondition, which means res uh, require true. And now we have these five uh, proof obligation for you to establish, right? And also, finally, the two slides, I simply give you some tips. When you do the proofs, you will find these two rules uh, useful. Okay, it's a very quick walkthrough with you, just about the final topics, okay? Uh, any questions? Is we okay? Okay, I can, so, the last lecture is always a little bit of a uh, high level, but I try to give you as uh, as many iteration as possible, but it is what it is. Okay, I'm going to give you some future reference for you to study, and that will be everything I will need to cover for this semester. Okay, any questions? Okay, if no, then, uh, okay, best of luck to you. If I uh, do hold any review session for you guys, I'll let you know. Otherwise, best of luck. I'll see you later. Bye-bye.